Open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, and we're going to close out chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. Again, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 21 through the end of the chapter. Again, it should be our desire when we gather as the people of God, or any time that we, even in private worship, come to the Word of God, that our prayer should be, draw me nearer near blessed lord that that we would have a, a an abiding and a, a deep a a, a transformative uh, type of experience with with our lord that that empowers us propels encourages us uh to to walk uh, the walk that he has called us to so with that being said we're going to look this morning as our gospel writer luke begins to close the curtain on the ministry of the forerunner, John the Baptist. He has brought to bear any number of witnesses. And if you, as you read the scriptures many times, it'll say something along the lines, uh, two or three witnesses. And so it's a big deal that there are multiple testimonies, multiple attestations to this uh, appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, beginning uh, with uh, the, the angel and then the angels and the, the prophetic word and the testimonies of Simeon and Anna and uh, all of these uh, diverse testimonies to the unique uh, identity and the unique role of both John the Baptist but ultimately Jesus Christ. And so again, as we look at this, I guess, penultimate testimony of John the Baptist, the forerunner of our Savior, we're going to look this morning at, at these three final testimonies to who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish for us. So again, begin reading with me in verse 21. Now when all of the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying. The heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. And Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son as was supposed of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jani, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Maoth, the son of Mattathias, the son of uh, Semain, the, the son of Josek, the son of Jodah, the son of Jonan, the son of Rasa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shetil, the son of Neri, the son of Mel. Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kosam, the son of Elmadam, the son of Joram, the son of Mephat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Malia, the son of Minna, the son of Matatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Selah, the son of Nashon, the son of Amimadad, the son of Admin, the son of Arnai the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Ru, the son of Pelig, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Ar Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahaliel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the Son of God. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your grace, for the revelation and the accomplishment of your Son, Jesus. May we faithfully and may we accurately proclaim his truth. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I haven't seen much more dramatic theater uh, than my third, fourth, and fifth grade plays. 
but I kind of have the image of kind of some preliminary acts being carried out, the curtain closing, and the orchestra music beginning to soar as the curtain is parted on the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. What we see here as in verse 18 is the account very briefly of how John's life on earth and his ministry uh, came to an end at, at his murder uh, by, by Herod. And having mentioned that, John then moves forward to begin to give the account of Jesus stepping into the forefront and beginning this ministry here uh, upon earth. And so we see, first of all, beginning in verse 21, the, the testimony of Jesus' baptism. And just kind of a, a bit of a, an aside here that we can see here that baptism is, is important. Uh, we're Baptists, so I guess that goes without saying at, at some level. Uh, there are really no Christians that don't practice baptisms, even those that do it wrongly, like those Presbyterians I so dearly love. But it seems obvious to me that baptism is, is a rite that, that stands in continuity with the Old Covenant, again being practiced with the proselytes, the Gentiles, that, that became convinced of the truth of Yahweh God and wanting to identify with them. And then John the Baptist kind of making a transition and calling the Jews to understand that they had no special privilege being descendants of Abraham, that they needed to repent and again identify themselves as ultimately as sinners in need of, of a Savior. And so Jesus chooses to to come to this uh, uh, older cousin, uh, John the, the Baptist, and submit himself to this, to this rite which he commands for his church to practice, seems clear to me, by immersion for those who openly profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and then we're to be about the business in the church of continuing to disciple them, to mature them in the faith. And so, call me narrow-minded. Some of you call me worse. But I can't see it any other way. That just seems to be the way the, the Bible presents this business. So it's important. And so our Lord humbled himself. And that that is an important New Testament concept. We spent a lot of time... Uh, I guess it's been three or four years ago now on Sunday night, going very closely through the book of Philippians. And there we see this great account of the, the humbling of the Lord Jesus Christ that, that although he was eternally glorious and coexistent with the Father, that he allowed himself to experience the limitations of taking on humanity and he humbled himself to, to every authority and, and every right and every reality of what it meant to, to be a man. And so Jesus Christ humbled himself, coming to John, identifying himself with sinners, and foreshadowing the reality that, that one day in three short years he would be buried. And so this baptism, as, as uh, the Apostle Paul speaks of it in Romans 6, that we have been buried like unto Christ in baptism, and we've been raised to walk in the newness of life. What a great symbol when we practice baptism here of the reality of what it means to be born again. And so Jesus identifies with us in this, this great uh, act, in this what ultimately for us is, is, is the sign and seal of the, of the new covenant practiced uh, within uh, the church. And so Jesus identifies with sinners in humbling himself. And we see this testimony of the descending of the Spirit of God in a, in a visible form as, as a dove. And we're told that, that John was told 
that this is to be the sign to you when you see that, that particular sign that he is indeed the one. And it seems to me to be one of the ways, and there are going to be multiple ways, that Scripture and, and God himself is bearing witness to the reality that, yes, this one is the ultimate and he is the promised king in the line of David, F fulfilling the, the promises uh, made to David long ago. We may say more about those in a minute. So, we see the testimony at Jesus' baptism, his humility, his identity, and this reality of the Spirit coming, and in essence, where the old covenant kings were anointed with oil, and sometimes we're told the Spirit of God came upon them in, in that moment. That certainly wasn't universally the case, but it was a symbol of God's approval on that king. So what do we have? Is the Spirit of God in some way that, I don't understand exactly. But the passage here, and, and let's don't, don't miss this, this is a very Trinitarian passage. Who do we see in it? The Father speaking, the Son being baptized, and the Spirit descending. Very clear picture of the distinctive persons in the Trinity. Now, I try to be a nice guy. It doesn't always work, okay? But there are doctrinal truths that really must be defended, and we must be reminded of them, and they're important. And the Trinity, although we may not fully understand it, and I don't, but I believe it. That God, who has eternally existed, not in three forms or three modes, as the heretic T.D. Jakes teaches in his mega church in Texas, okay? I know I, people, well, he's so helpful. He's got such a great word to, to women and to this and that. Listen, go do a little Hinduism. It might help you. Do you some yoga. It might stretch some of those tight muscles out. It might help you, but just because it's helpful doesn't make it true. Okay? So, we have the three distinct persons who are one eternal God being revealed as acting in this one point in time. Father voicing approval, Son submitting and being revealed and being uniquely anointed in some way that, again, I, I can't fathom that exactly, but being anointed for these three years, that he will walk the dusty streets of Palestine and be aggravated and abused by fallen human beings just like you and me. Now, don't raise your hand, but how many of you have been aggravated or irritated by a fellow human being in the last few days? And that doesn't include your, your mate, your spouse, okay? I'll just representatively raise my hand. And how many of you have to say, I sinned because I was aggravated and irritated? Well, Jesus lived among us and never sinned. Wow. Wow. So, Father, Son, Spirit clearly revealed here and we have this testimony taken from really kind of a convergence of, of two passages a royal psalm psalm 2 uh, verse 7 you're my beloved son with you i am well pleased go back in your bible to the book of isaiah the prophet isaiah just for a moment to ver to the, this citation is from chapter 42, Isaiah 42, back in your Old Testament. Now, was it last week I mentioned that in the book of Isaiah, 
you have this transition, and even some people think there were two Isaiahs. They're wrong. Sorry, but they are. There's one Isaiah that kind of transitions from the message of warning, condemnation, judgment, to a word of hope that begins in verse 40. And this word of hope is centered around a promised individual, a promised one, who here is spoken of as the chosen servant, who later will be spoken of as what kind of servant? The suffering servant. And so here... Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. And faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he's established justice in the earth. And the coastlands wait for his law. Now, if you would just walk back through that and think about this particular assignment, one of the things that that we are warring over, sometimes rightly, sometimes wrongly, but it is right for every image bearer to have justice, to, to have equality under the law. That is a right thing. Sometimes... It gets way out of whack in a sinful world. But notice here, the chosen one who is under the anointing of the Spirit is going to bring forth justice, but he's not going to cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. He's not going to be a rebel rouser. Now, then he's going to be so gentle he will not break this bruised reed, but he's not going to compromise over the issue of justice. And... I get faint and discouraged. You know what? Just, just for a fact, I'm looking right through here, and I see a big swath of empty chairs. That discourages me. It ought to discourage you. Okay? I get discouraged. I really do. And so, but this one will not ultimately be discouraged. But he's going to bring forth justice. Now, folks, there ain't but one person that can meet those qualifications and his name is this one upon whom the spirit descended and his name is Jesus Christ and so we see the convergence of the the chosen servant the the promised servant the suffering servant and the anointed king that the psalmist says you better kiss the son lest he be angry that's S-O-N son Yeah, because he's going to rule the earth with what? A rod of iron. A rod of iron. And so this is the one of whom we're speaking. And so we see here the Heavenly Father is giving testimony that indeed you are the promised one, the one that we'll see in chapter 4 that is anointed because the Spirit is upon him to preach this great message of hope to those who are in the midst of suffering. The great news of the gospel is that there is ultimately transcendent, overcoming, eternal hope in each and every situation for those who know Jesus Christ. That you are uniquely my son, as John would speak of it, the one uniquely begotten of the Heavenly Father. It wasn't unusual for kings to be called the Son of God and for there were other references to the Son of God. But you need to understand that Jesus is monogenes, uniquely begotten by the Father through the agency of the Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, making Him uniquely the God-man and the fulfillment of the prophecies that have been made uh, to David. Look look over in the book of Colossians real quick. Chapter 1. This is the Jesus that Luke is revealing that he is bearing uh, witness to. 
Notice how Paul unpacks this. And I've told you many times, should I ask this as a question? I think I will. Give me three of the most prominent and distinct Christological passages to be found in the New Testament. All right. Everybody get their ink pen out. You need to know these. Gospel of John, chapter 1, in beginning was the Word. Okay? Number 2, Hebrews, chapter 2. Number 3, Colossians, chapter 1. I'll give you one more as a bonus. We've already mentioned it. Number 4, Philippians, chapter 2. Okay? Those speak distinctly that Jesus is different from anybody else. That he is the uniquely begotten Son of God. And so, Paul says it this way. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, I don't, I'm not sure the Jehovah's Witnesses use this one. I, I, he's firstborn. He was created. They do? Okay. So he was created. No, he is the protocost. He is the rightful inheritor of all things. It has nothing to do with the beginning because Jesus Christ is just as eternal as the Heavenly Father. And they mess up the train. L- listen, I showed the last JW that showed up at my house was 15 years ago. And when I pulled out my Greek Nestle Adel- uh, Allen New Testament and showed them that their translation, showed them the grammatical rules, your New World Translation is wrong. They left. I guess that's why people don't like me very much. Again, they're wrong. And folks, it is okay to tell people that, that when they're wrong, you're wrong. You catch some up? No, I'm, I won't go there. Okay. All right, you are uniquely my son, for by him all things were created. Jesus, our creator, in heaven, on earth, visible, and invisible, or thrones, or dominions, or rulers, or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. They were created for his glory. And I think ultimately it's the glory of his redemption of all things. You know, we got into this the other night. Uh, kind of, I think in our Q&A here on the disciple now. And kind of this why, why sin and why and da da da. And, I mean, it's tough questions, okay? It, it really is. But I believe that God created the best of all possible worlds. And folks, I buried my wife August 1st of last year. I don't feel that right now. I don't. But I believe it to be true that in heaven one day, I will declare that it was good and right for my beautiful wife to die such a premature death and for us to suffer with my children and my grandchildren for all of these years because God is glorified in the redemption worked by his son and pulling flabby losers like me out of this miserable, wretched world. Okay? So, all things were created by him and for him, and he's still keeping them together. They don't fly apart because Jesus is still sovereign over all things, okay? He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, wow, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is the Son in whom I'm well pleased. That I'm ple- I don't understand how all of the fullness dwells in Jesus. I, it just does. It just does. Okay. You're the promised one. You're uniquely my son. And you have eternally pleased me. Now, I've got to walk you through this a little bit. So, go to John 1. I'm trying not to have to pronounce all those funny names again. So, In 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was prostontheon. That's the Greek, prostontheon, towards God. And the idea, as I understand it, is face to face. That the distinct son was in an intimate face to face in which there was eternal, infinite, glorious admiration of one another. I heard somebody, it may have been on Facebook, that, that God needed to create because he was lonely. Folks. That's a lie. It's straight from the pit of hell. It smells like smoke. God was eternally rejoicing in the company of the Trinity. And he, he created us freely out of no intrinsic need within himself. Okay? So they're in this intimate and glorious relationship. And God was pleased for there to be some type of interruption in which the Word would become flesh and no longer dwelling fully there in heaven with the Father, but the Son would humble Himself, taking the form of the Sovereign, and He would come in, into the, to the world. And He would tick everybody off by making the claim that I and the Father are one. Again, folks, never let a non-Christian slide with the statement, Jesus was a good man. Folks, if he is not the Son of God and Lord of all and creator of all things, he is not a good man because it is not a good thing to claim that I and the Father are one unless it be so. Okay? So that one, you can't let it slide. So they're eternally and mutually enjoying one another's fellowship. Go to John 17. Can't preach without going to John 17 occasionally. Verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have in some way veiled that glory in human flesh. Now, we're going to mutually enjoy my glory when I come back to you, now look at verse 24. What is his prayer for you? This is why everything is ultimately going to be okay. Whatever problems we have in this temporal world, and folks, we can have problems. We can have problems. They can be serious. They, they can be painful. They can really be hurtful. But it's all going to be okay because this prayer is going to be answered. Father, I desire, desire, I desire that they, that's you and me and us and everyone who knows Jesus, that they also whom you've given me may be with me where I am to see my glory. Folks, at that time, I'll understand it all. At that time, I can say, I can praise you, Lord, because you've done all things well and you've done all things right. Okay? At that time, all of the things of this life that are so burdensome to me and ca cause, create such sorrow and anxiety, legitimately, they will be in my rearview window. And so, see my glory that you've given me because you love me we were in this eternal relationship. We loved each other. We didn't need anything. But we have chosen, and in fact, you have chosen, that we would create and that you would give me a bride through which I would be glorified. The Father is giving the Son a creation that he would redeem through his blood so that he would be glorified in and through them for all of eternity. And all God's people just sit there and go, well, that's really cool. You know, all right. He's running, running a little long. You know, it's no big deal. I mean, Jesus' eternal glory, and we're going to get to enjoy it for all of eternity, and we're going to be so overwhelmed with it that we're actually going to smile on occasion in heaven. Okay. All right. Testimony of the Heavenly Father. Jesus is the promised one. You're uniquely my son, and you have eternally pleased me. The third testimony. 
back in Luke. The testimony of Jesus' family. Like every family, it's not without its knots and nuts. Okay? Uh, I could tell you about a few of our nuts in my family and a few of our knots in our family, and you could probably tell me about a few of, of your own. I have a cousin that thought it would be really smart to drive two miles up the road and rob the grocery store. Gosh, they'd never figure out who he was. Um, you know, there's only a thousand people in Tryon, Georgia. You know, God, they couldn't, they couldn't figure out who Kenny Duke was. I mean, you know, he'd only lived there since he was born. So, knots and nuts, we all got them. So did Jesus. Whose genealogy? Not going to get into that very much other than to say commentators think maybe Matthew was doing Joseph and Luke is doing Mary. That's possible. There are other, uh, other ways of seeing it. Uh, there may have been some uh, uh, Leverite marriages involved in which there were fathers and stepfathers, and that's why some of the names differ. I'm not sure. Go spend you $1,000 on commentaries and spend your life trying to figure that one out. You know, whatever. But it is the genealogy of Jesus. And just like uh, in some of the Old Testament passages, particularly Genesis, when you get into the begats, and I know all of y'all have really been studying the begats, right? Everybody, everybody doing a read through the Bible plan? You really, really drill down on those begats, don't you? How many of you, tell the truth, before God Almighty here today, how many of you become speed readers when you get to the begats? Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. I see that hand. I see that hand. Be blessed. There's really some interesting stuff there if you'll take your time. Now, most of these people we don't know anything about. A few of them that we do. Okay? And uh, it's interesting that, that Luke goes in the backwards direction from Matthew in normal genealogies. He works backwards uh, to, uh, to Adam and to God. Most of them kind of run uh, forward. There are no women. So some of you women really need to get mad. I want y'all to stomp out of here today. And Luke, had, Luke and Paul both had a problem with women. Okay? That would be good. And so, uh, but um, uh, there's no women in it. Uh, this one has, or Matthew, uh, this one has 77 names. Matthew has 42. There's maybe something to be said about uh, that. But there are distinctives. They're not just alike, but they do tell the story of the same uh, person, why is it important? Well, Jesus is a human. He entered the world through a human family. And the writer of Hebrews thinks that's a very good thing, that he is our faithful and merciful and understanding high priest because he learned obedience through that which he suffered as a man. And so it's a good thing. So he's fully uh, human. Uh, he's Jewish. Guess whose name's there? Abraham. He's got the line, as we used to say in the song, well, he's got the right last name, okay? And so uh, uh, it's important that, that he was Jewish, and ultimately what? He is the son that fulfills the unbreakable promise made to David, recorded in 1 Samuel 2, 7, uh, or 2 Samuel 7, and 1 Chronicles 17. You're going to have a son. He's going to come from your body, and he's going to rule and reign forever. He's going to be an eternal king, and he is not going to be like your not head biological sons. He's going to usher in an age of perfect righteousness and justice. So, finally, uh, just a few things that are noteworthy. Uh, there in verse 31, you see uh, the account of Boaz. Well, uh, most of you ladies and everybody should like the book of Ruth. It's a great piece of literature. You ought to read it. Okay? But we know the story of Boaz and uh, his uh, relationship with Ruth and his willingness to embrace this uh, kinsman redeemer role. And we find what? That this Moabite woman, a woman whose whole nation was under the curse of God because of their incestuous ancestry. And yet they're included what? As one of the knots in the family tree. And then we see the story of Judah and Perez. Judah, one of the, the 12 patriarchs, enters into a sexual relationship with his widowed daughter-in-law. And she conceives twins. And 
Again, they're a part of Jesus' family tree because Jesus is what? The lion of the tribe of Judah. And of course, we have uh, the great patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And again, this promised line coming through that big, sissy, mama's boy, lying, thieving Jacob. And that, that was his good points. I mean, really, if Jacob and Esau met me at the first tee on the golf course, I'd tell Jacob, you wait for the next group. You come with me, Esau. Hey. And I'll play, listen, I play with two Baptist preachers. I'll just about play with anybody. So, you know. Noah. God used him greatly, but again, in some sense, a great failure. We see the name of Seth introduced to him in Genesis 5. And again, uh, one in the image of Adam. And it seems like God begin, people begin to worship God again in that time frame. And then... Adam, the original image bearer, the father of us all. Again, there is a reality to the universal family of the human race. No matter what we look like, unfortunately, no matter what we act like, there is a reality to that. We are traced to one human ancestor who was uniquely the creation of God from the dust of the earth entrusted with stewardship of this church, of this earth, and he would fall from that place of innocence and great responsibility and privilege, and it would be one that would be called the second Adam, that would come through the, the loins of Adam, Seth, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Judah, and Perez, Boaz, and David, and a whole bunch more to reverse the curse brought into the world through the rebellion of our first father, our father Adam. That's our Jesus. That's the Jesus that Luke wants us to see. He wants us to see among the many witnesses he's already introduced us to. I've mentioned them earlier. But yes, that at his baptism we see the great testimony of father and spirit to the uniqueness of the Son. We see the testimony of the Father. This is the one you've been waiting for. And even the testimony of history, of the family. He is the right one. And I, you know what? I, 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 I'm assuming Luke went to the temple one day and began to dig through the dusty records because they kept them. We don't have them anymore because just as Jesus said, what? In 70 A.D., not st one stone would remain on the other. So this is our Jesus. This is our Savior. He is the beloved Son in whom the Father is well pleased. He was well pleased before the cross. He's well pleased after the cross because His Son has purchased the bride that the Father gave Him from all eternity past with the shedding of his blood. Pray with me if you will. Father, we thank you for your truth, for your promises, for the accomplishment of, of your gospel. Lord, we thank you that you have so clearly and without any mistake, you have given to us these great testimonies. May we live in light of your truth. May we experience the powerful realities of your gospel. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.